Well, good morning and welcome back to the Machine Learning Coffee Seminar also here in Kukuo. So, so today we have the pleasure of, of uh, welcoming uh, Dr. Chris Ellingworth uh, from Department of Genesis, University of Cambridge to give us a talk about a maximum likelihood approach for modeling viral evolution using genome sequence data. Please. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Uh, so I read uh, this book uh, over Christmas and in many ways it's a book about uh, not worrying so much uh, because we read on the news about aeroplanes crashing and so it makes us afraid that when we get an aeroplane uh, the aeroplane will also crash. Uh, but in fact many millions of aeroplanes take off and land safely uh, uh, every year. Uh, they just don't get reported. So we need a kind of, the book is how we need a, a kind of fact-based approach uh, to the world. Um, but he also gives a list of things that we maybe should be worried about. Uh, and here are, here are some of them. Uh, number one being uh, a global pandemic. So you may read in the newspaper about the coronavirus uh, from China, uh, this sort of new uh, pandemic virus. So he's, uh, he's, he's sort of concerned about uh, pandemic viruses and their potential to uh, cause harm. And uh, maybe the key example of a pandemic virus is uh, influenza. Um, this is uh, a photo from the 1918 uh, influenza pandemic. And uh, the uh, pandemic uh, virus uh, killed more people uh, than the whole of the First World War uh, combined. So maybe something between 3 and 6% of the uh, whole world's uh, population. Uh, in some towns, uh, something like 90 to 95% of people uh, died through the virus. And so then influenza remains a a virus that is important to study, to take lots of uh, different perspectives on. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about work of, on influenza and how we can use genome sequence data to find out more about this uh, disease. So you might ask, how does a new uh, viral pandemic start? And uh, viral pandemics uh, often come uh, via transmission from uh, animals, um, uh, often bats, but uh, the flu virus uh, often uh, is kind of native to birds, uh, also spreads uh, from pigs uh, as well. And uh, it evolves through, uh, well, it's an evolutionary process of transmission to uh, humans. And uh, a lot of my work is about uh, what's called population genetics, which is a kind of mathematical approach to studying evolutionary processes. So if we think about uh, evolution, uh, we can break evolution down into uh, different components. Uh, one of those is mutation, that if we have a, uh, a genome sequence, so an organism with uh, a genome, uh, that uh, you see a mutation from one nucleotide uh, to another uh, in the genome. So a change in the genome, which can lead to a change in the behaviour of the organism, the change in the behaviour of the virus. Uh, another one is selection. So some uh, organisms will grow uh, faster than others, or perhaps spread from one person to another uh, more efficiently. Uh, we then have transmission bottlenecks. So maybe uh, in one host there are a very large number of viruses, but when it transmits to the second host, uh, maybe only one or two of those viruses are actually transmitted. So there's a kind of bottleneck process which also affects the virus. And then a final one is one called uh, reassortment. So just like a, a, a human uh, has chromosomes uh, containing our genetic information, so the flu virus has these eight uh, segments uh, of, of genome. And uh, if two different viruses get into the same cell, you can have what's called reassortment, which is where the segments from different viruses are, are shuffled and form new combinations uh, to create a new and genetically different virus. So then there may be two ways in which a new uh, flu pandemic uh, could begin. And one of those is through a process of mutation and selection. So we have viruses such as this H5N1 strain uh, which is found mostly in Southeast Asia and uh, is quite a severe virus. The mortality rate is something like 60%, um, but only a few hundred people have ever been infected with this. And the reason that it's hard to get this virus is because it's only transmitted directly uh, from a bird to a person. You have to be very close to a bird. Uh, and at the moment, the virus doesn't spread from one person to another person. But it led to a question uh, of... Uh, whether the virus could evolve uh, to be uh, transmissible from one person to another and so to uh, go on and form a new pandemic. And so this was a question in influenza research 
and uh, to study this, uh, some scientists did uh, what's called an evolutionary experiment. That is, they took uh, the H5N1 virus and uh, they gave it to uh, a ferret and uh, over a succession of transmission events, so starting off by using a swab to transfer the viruses from one animal to another, uh, they kept uh, repeating that and evolving the virus uh, in the ferret uh, until the point where they found that having gained five mutations, uh, the virus became transmissible through the air from one ferret to another. Um, now this was a slightly controversial experiment, I won't talk much about the controversy. Uh, there was a question about should you make this new pandemic virus? Um, uh, but the researchers said, uh, don't worry, we're very, very careful. Um, so uh, we'll be careful with it. Anyway, so there's a question, well, so there's a question, should you do this? Um, but uh, I suppose my perspective is, well, if somebody else has done this, uh, what can we learn from the data? So uh, here was uh, the uh, data as it were ava was available. And they had done uh, two experiments uh, from which they had data. Uh, the first one involved two transmission events. Uh, so here the red is before transmission, the blue is after. So that's a transmission event, two transmissions uh, for one uh, virus and then a slightly different virus. Uh, they had four cases of transmission from one animal to another. And it's what's called short read viral sequencing. So the data looks something like this. As I said, flu has these eight uh, segments of genome. And a segment is something like 900 to 2,300 nucleotides. That's some, it's quite short in terms of uh, genetics. Uh, you know, the human genome is many billions of letters, but this is uh, sort of around 1,000 to 2,000. And by short read, what it means is that each read is about 150 nucleotides long. So if this is our, our genome, we have all these different short reads collected from uh, the virus. The reads are actually paired, so I haven't shown this here, but it might be that uh, this virus and this virus, or this, these two reads are paired, and that means that they come from the same virus. We can know that they come from the same underlying uh, genome. And we have quite a lot of data. So we're talking about 100,000 reads per segment of the virus, so quite a lot of data. But the fact that the uh, data are made of these short reads uh, creates some technical challenges. So uh, here, here's one of the, here's the key challenge. So if we were to suppose that uh, two viruses differ by only one variant in the whole genome, well then uh, we can use population genetics, this kind of mathematical framework, to describe what would happen to the frequency of this variant A uh, if it was under selection. So here we've got Q is the frequency of the variant and S is the strength of selection. And we can make a model of this. So if uh, S is greater than zero, so positive selection means that the frequency of the A variant increases over time in a kind of mathematically predictable way. And if, the, if S is less than zero, so that means deleterious selection or negative selection, that means that over time we expect the variant to die out. So we can take a sort of simple model of what will happen with one variant, uh, sort of draw a kind of mathematical model, and then if we have data collected over time, we can fit uh, a model to the data in quite a simple way. So in the case of just one variant, uh, we fit a model to the data, so one, uh, uh, one locus model tells us what's the strength of selection on that variant. But the challenge is that uh, viruses, uh, of course, have genomes, and genomes differ by more than one variant. So the reality might be something like this. Here we have uh, three variants in the same segment. Again, we have an A here, which is under selection. Um, but you can see that the variants are linked together on genomes. So here's a genome with an A, a T, and a C. Here's one with a C, a G, and a G. So, so these variants are linked together in, in a genome. And when the virus evolves, it's copying whole genomes uh, rather than these kind of individual variants one at a time. So now if I imagine that this A is under positive selection, uh, what we see over time is that this A variant will increase in frequency uh, over time. But as it's done so, it's carried with it uh, this T at position B, and it's carried with it the C uh, at this position here. So actually, all of these three variants increase in frequency, even though only one of them is under selection. So if we were to take a simple model of one thing moving independently from each other, we would, uh, we would infer that all of these three things uh, are all under selection when only one of them is. So this is a thing called hitchhiking. The variants kind of hitchhike on each other and that makes it harder to learn what selection is doing. So really we need a way of identifying uh, how the different reads are 
how, how these things are connected, so how the variants are linked together on a genome. And the problem is that the short read data doesn't describe a whole genome. It just tells you little bits and pieces. So we've developed a process to uh, look into that, uh, which uh, has a few steps. So we note, first of all, that there might only be a few variants of interest. And if we look at our short reads, there might be some reads that cover a sort of subset of these positions. So here we have these three positions, and we can collect data of what we call partial genotype data. So here we can see a number of reads uh, describing different collections of variants out of few positions in the genome. And uh, if we do that for not all of the reads, we can identify potentially multiple sets of data within this. So here we have some reads up here, uh, and these reads maybe cover four positions in the genome. So this tells us about everything, so 483, 177, 203 from a single genome. That's a whole set of data describing those. So these each describe four variants. Um, these describe three variants at once, so here's our data set up here. And these describe two variants, these describe one variant. And, and the key thing is that each set of reads, taking a read doesn't change the population. So all of these sets of reads are independent from all the other ones. And so the independence means that we can potentially have a framework uh, for a sort of compound log likelihood. Uh, that is, uh, we sort of sum over log likelihoods of observing each of these things independently. Well, that's all good, but we still need a kind of state space. So what is our, our, our model space that, of genomes that is emitting uh, these different reads? Uh, and we can do that in a kind of combinatorial way. So we have all our short reads, and we have an algorithm uh, which identifies a set of underlying genotypes. So we haven't observed these directly. We can sort of infer a set of genomes such that every short read is emitted by at least one of these. So a kind of combinatorics tells us a sort of set of possible whole genomes. And then we can use, the, we've got a set of possible genotypes, and we observe uh, kind of all these uh, sets of reads from this. And if the reads were perfect reads, if they were perfectly error-free, um, then this would be a set of multinomial draws. So we've got a set of things coming from this, uh, sort of loci, and that would be a multinomial, that would be multinomial, that would be multinomial, and so forth. Uh, but that's not quite correct, so the reads uh, aren't that informative, they have error in them. So we then do a set of uh, uh, processes to deal with the error. Uh, one example is that when you get your read, so it might be a set of nucleotides like this, you get a kind of inherent quality to it. Um, so first step, it, this comes off the machine, um, and the error rate is uh, 10 to the power of the minus this over 10. So uh, if this is 30, that means that there's an error rate of 0.1%. And so, for example, we can filter the data so we can get rid of any uh, reads that we see that have a quality that is too low or below some kind of threshold, normally 30, so a rate of 0.1% is sort of key for, for, for chucking away some of the data. Um, so we can, we can do that. So there's some intrinsic properties of the data that allow us to uh, do some filtering. But it's even a bit more complicated than that. There's really two sources that can arise in the data. Um, the first is that we have a, a person, so here's a person who's infected with lots of different viruses. And we collect a sample from that person. So maybe you take a nasal swab, you stick it up their right nostril, you collect some viruses, and you put it in your sample. Uh, but you don't necessarily know that the sample you've collected is fully representative of what's in the host. What would happen if you put the thing up their left nostril instead of their right one? Would they be the same viral populations? So what you collect physically from the person might not be fully representative of everything that's there. And secondly, when you do sequencing, you get noise and kind of error in the data, some of which is kind of measurable, but some of it is not. Um, so there's sort of unknown amount of noise here and a bit of an unknown uh, here. So then what can we do about that? Well, there's again a, a framework to uh, deal with this. Uh, and the one we've chosen is, is a, a bit like a, a beta binomial, essentially. So we suppose, uh, ideally, that what we've done is we've taken our two samples at the same time. We've sampled the right nostril and the left nostril, and we, we've uh, sequenced both of them. So we've then got a particular uh, nucleotide and allele, so a, a, a position in the genome sequence, and we've uh, observed two samples. Uh, so we've observed N1 and N2 copies of uh, our variant, and in each sample, the total number of observations is N1 and N2. We can then find the mean frequency across the whole data set, uh, so we get an estimate uh, Q of the underlying, the kind of real frequency in the population as a whole. 
Uh, and then we characterize a beta binomial distribution uh, with these two parameters. So alpha is C times Q, and beta is C times 1 minus Q. Um, so that characterizes a beta binomial distribution, uh, two parameters. And uh, the unknown in this case is this parameter C. And so C is uh, a kind of estimator of the extent of noise uh, in the data. So if we were to imagine that C uh, gets large, so if C tends to infinity, uh, it tends towards a, a binomial or a multinomial sample. Uh, if C gets small, as C goes towards one, it becomes uniform, so that's a kind of uninformative distribution. Uh, and then we generalize that to the kind of multinomial case. Uh, so we have uh, this kind of Dirichlet multinomial uh, likelihood, uh, which I haven't put the equation up, but essentially it's an over-dispersed version of the multinomial distribution. Here's the same uh, mean, but you can see this has more variance to it than uh, the standard multinomial. Um, so, so some pros and cons. Uh, well, it allows in a kind of generic way to fit a sort of model of over-dispersion in the data. We can kind of take a proxy measurement um, uh, of, uh, we can take some, some property of the data, measure about how over-dispersed it is compared to multinomial. So we get a, a kind of model for uh, the extent of noise in the data. Second advantage, this is an analytical function, and so we can evaluate this very fast uh, computationally. That's really key to doing these things. Some cons is that the noise isn't purely kind of Dirichlet multinomial. We've got one noise parameter, so maybe more noise parameters would be helpful. Uh, we don't know. And then also we can't actually get these replicates. So people tend not to sample the right nostril and the left nostril. So in that case, we have to find some kind of proxy aspects of the data. Maybe two samples collected close together in time or some subset of the data that doesn't seem to change uh, very much or some subset of the data that seems to change in a very consistent way. So we have to kind of come up with a sort of uh, a proxy statistic uh, for the kind of the replicates. So there's, there's kind of pros and cons of this, but it's, it's what we do. So where we are, well, given our short data, short reads, uh, we get a kind of set of potential full genotypes. That's a kind of model space. Uh, we get an ordered set of, of data. So we divide the reads into what we call partial genotypes or partial haplotypes. And then we've got a likelihood function that gives us some estimation of noise uh, in the data. And so now what we can do, we have this likelihood function. We can fit a model to the data. So here's a model. Uh, it's kind of a mathematical model without the equations. Uh, of mutation and selection in the flu virus. So here we see mutation happens at some rate between different genotypes, and selection refers some genotypes to others. So TGA, that's not very fit, and so that dies out over time, uh, whereas AGT is, is better at replicating, so that kind of grows in frequency over time. So essentially mutation and selection. So we apply this to the data from the H5N1 experiment, and we get a kind of map like this. So uh, here, uh, these circles are different genotypes. So this is kind of representative of uh, different sort of genetic structure in the population. And uh, genotypes that are joined by an edge in the graph are, um, uh, they are connected by one mutation. They're one mutation apart. And so as you move through genetic space, you go along the graph. And then the color indicates how fit these viruses are. That is how good they are replicating in the, in the ferret. So the blue ones here are less fit, the kind of yellow brown ones are more fit, uh, the orange ones grow very fast, and the red ones are kind of much, much more adapted to the new environment. And one of the first things we see is that this network, so taken from a single experiment, uh, has sort of different directions in which one can go. So starting from these, th these are sort of initial genotypes uh, that are seen most commonly in the population. And if the population moves this way, uh, it sort of evolves down to these haplotypes, uh, it gets fitter. So the yellow ones are fitter than the blue. So that is one direction for evolution. Um, but it could also go up here. So it could go up towards these types over here, or it could go up towards these types over here. And so it can adapt in multiple different directions. And so what that says is that actually the evolution is a little bit unpredictable. Here we have our two uh, cases, uh, our two transmission events, or two, two particular animals. And in one case, the blue genotypes win, and in this case, the green genotypes win. So the population is going either up here or down there. So it's very, very sensitive to the starting conditions of the experiment. Secondly, if we look at experiment two, what we see is in this case, uh, a lot of other genotypes, and it looks a bit like a kind of explosion. So it's going from these genotypes out kind of this way and this way and, and in all different directions. 
So our two experiments give consistent results. Here are some statistics where the things overlap with each other. And they're actually very, very similar. Um, but uh, it's saying that the population can evolve in all different directions. And, and what that means is something like this. Well, firstly, it's consistent with what we would expect from basic evolutionary theory. Because if you take an organism that is very poorly adapted to an environment, in this case, the virus is poorly adapted to the ferret. What it means is that there's multiple possible mutations uh, that are available for the virus to evolve into. Uh, it's not just kind of one mutation available. It can get, you know, 10, 20 mutations. Uh, so it can evolve in all these different directions. I mean, the consequence of that is that predicting a kind of genetic route of pandemic onset is very hard. So you can go out there and you can sample viruses from birds and you can identify, you know, this mutation seems to be doing something uh, that would make it more transmissible to a mammal. Um, but actually, this is a sort of hard problem. This prediction thing uh, is very difficult, simply because the virus can go in so many directions. Uh, we also have a phenomenon called epistasis, where the effect of a given mutation depends on the background that it lands on. So a mutation might be uh, better for growing in a mammal uh, on one sequence background and worse on, an, on another sequence background. So it's really a very complicated problem uh, to identify where's the next pandemic coming from. Okay, so uh, I'm going to skim through some other applications. Uh, another way in which a pandemic can turn up is this uh, method called reassortment. So the 2009 swine flu uh, came through a series of kind of mixing up of different viruses. Essentially, there was a human virus that got into a, a pig. And uh, by the way, the picture of the baby and the pig, the pig is more at risk. That's kind of the message. But anyway, it got from a, a person into a pig. Uh, and then uh, some other viruses from uh, bird origin, uh, from uh, swine origin and from uh, human origin uh, kind of combined together. There's what's called this triple reassortment event. And so another reassortment here, this one with this one, uh, ended up giving the, the swine flu uh, of uh, 2009. Actually, the fact it came from people a long time ago, that meant some older people, so people who were born before sort of 1957, uh, had some protection against the 2009 swine flu due to this kind of history uh, back here. So can we study reassortments? Well, we can. So we've looked at data from uh, volunteers who've been given flu. Um, so this is uh, data from 13 uh, different people who volunteered. We've collected sequences from those people uh, over time. And uh, we can use a very similar evolutionary model. So this is like our model before, uh, but now with this kind of mixing parameter here. So we're, we're measuring the rate at which viruses mix within a human host. And it turns out that rate is very low. And it's, it's kind of low uh, because viruses in a person seem to be separated in space. So that is, some viruses uh, get into part of the airway, some get into another part. And then reassortment happens very quickly, um, but it happens between the blue viruses and their offspring, between the red viruses and, and their offspring. And so the red ones reassort very quickly with each other. The blue ones mix very quickly with each other, but the red and the blue don't mix because they're too far away. So it seems to be reassortment. So this is different from what we're seeing in experiments with small animals, um, but reassortment is very slow in a person. Uh, we can make another model of uh, another virus. This is HIV. Uh, here we have mutation selection, and this is called uh, recombination. So another kind of uh, evolutionary process. And we've taken data. So this is from uh, untreated HIV infection, which doesn't really happen anymore, but uh, in the 1990s in Uganda. Um, so here's some data a kind of observation of patterns of evolution in a person. And here's our model. So recreating this pattern here with a few parameters, uh, we can reconstruct what's happening in HIV evolution. Again, the same, same kind of likelihood function, the same process. Uh, but moving on, I'm looking at uh, data from uh, people in hospital. Um, here's a first case. This is a child in hospital in London uh, with a severe immunodeficiency. And the first thing you see is the time scale of infection. So this is the viral load over time, and the infection begins at the end of July and is finally cleared in April. So this is influenza, but over several months of time. The second thing you see is that the standard drugs against flu don't work. So if you or I were to get flu, we'd probably be given oseltamivir or zonamivir. And these drugs are given, but they don't really do anything against the virus. Nitrosoxonide is kind of a second line, a slightly odd thing to use against flu, but it sort of sometimes works. Uh, in this case, giving this drug uh, doesn't seem to do anything uh, for the infection. We've done some analysis of the data, uh, and none of these three drugs work. 
And then at this point, they're given a new drug. So it's called favipiravir, and it's been used against other RNA viruses, um, but it's what's called compassionate use. So it's not licensed to use against flu, um, but the, the medics decided that they were going to try it just to see what happened. And you see as favipiravir is given, uh, the viral load drops uh, to almost zero. And uh, uh, then it sort of oddly, you don't see it for a couple of months, and then it comes back. And then you, uh, it's treated again with the same drug, uh, it goes away. So what can we learn from these data? We've learned uh, a few things. Uh, one is we've learned about, uh, we can show that the favipiravir works. It's quite hard to show it works because you can see here where it's given, it's given at the same time as uh, two other drugs. And this dotted line is the patient getting a bone marrow transplant. And uh, I've previously uh, skipped over, this is their immune system sort of temporarily recovered. So there's a lot going on. Um, but what you can see is that uh, down here, you see that the uh, virus becomes resistant to uh, this yellow drug here. So re resistance to zanamivir. And so when uh, the second time the patient is treated, uh, they've got a drug against which the virus is resistant and favipiravir. And so the combination works against uh, a resistant virus. So it seems to be that favipiravir is generally doing something. So we've been able to use uh, genetic data to isolate the effect of, of the new drug. Secondly, this is showing the effect of the drug uh, on, the, uh, on the virus. So it seems to work by uh, increasing the mutation rate of the virus. So it interferes with the way in which the virus replicates itself, uh, causes lots of errors in that replication process. And uh, it's not fully understood, but the idea is that gaining more and more mutations is generally bad. It's like being exposed to radiation. It's not good for the virus. And so here we see a signal that the, uh, the kind of mutations in the virus change uh, when the drug is given. Um, so that seems to be the mechanism uh, of infection. Um, uh, again, we've done a model of, so the same model with no model, we just learn frequencies. We can see here that some samples seem to come from one sort of set of genotypes up here. Uh, the rest of the population comes from these sets of genotypes. And uh, we can see that these sort of clade A viruses stay around this bit of sequence space, and clade B sort of escapes uh, kind of into these genotypes. Um, and we can learn some interesting evolutionary stuff about rates of uh, adaptation. But kind of what I'm sort of here to uh, talk about a bit is um, kind of where we want to go next. Um, so I've, I've sort of shown that we can get data from the past and we can learn something about evolution by looking at those uh, data sets. Potentially we can do some more modeling. We can learn more about the effects of these new drugs uh, against viral infection. There's some theory bits I haven't gone into. Uh, but the real question is, uh, is this sequence data useful in a kind of real-time context? So suppose there is somebody in hospital now. Uh, can we use genome sequencing to affect the way in which we treat that patient? Can we do better at treating uh, infection using sequence data? So I, I'm starting off by looking at severe respiratory illness, so mostly influenza, but we have some cases of other viruses. Uh, some cases can be a few months in length, and it's not really it's not really known what's the best thing to do. It tends to be that they get given different combinations of drugs to kind of see what happens. So it'd be quite complex medical circumstances. Uh, we can collect uh, viral samples sort of every two or three days if needed. Um, I've talked about short read data. There's also long read data, which is uh, faster to collect. So you can get it in a few hours as opposed to a few days. Um, but there's kind of new technology. So genome sequencing is going towards long read accurate sequences. So that's, that's going to get rid of the short read data problem, although we've kind of solved it. Um, so so part, potentially faster sequencing, so a shorter gap in time between collecting data and having the data. And there's a sort of simple case, uh, which looks like this. Uh, so what we think of as irreversible drug resistance. So you test the patient. Uh, is the patient's virus resistant to the drug? Uh, well, if it's not, you give them regular treatment if it is, you do something else. So this is a kind of simple decision tree. But we're starting to see more complicated things happen. Um, so here's some data from a patient, and they're given a particular drug. The virus becomes resistant, and then the drug is taken away, and the resistance goes away at the same time. And so if you have uh, this kind of concept of reversible drug resistance, it seems like potentially quite an uh, interesting situation. Because you, you might give the drug for a bit, and you, you start to get resistance, or you, you know, should you stop giving the drug uh, when resistance starts to emerge? Uh, depending on the effect of the 
drug against the virus. Um, so, so if there's a kind of interaction between the way in which you're giving the drug and the way in which the virus is evolving and the sort of effect of the drug on the population, uh, it seems like you have a sort of potentially uh, more complicated system uh, where instead of just making a simple decision, you might want to update that decision through time. So you see that there's some, you see there's no resistance, so you give a drug, you later observe that resistance is starting to kick in, and so you maybe take the drug or change the therapy, and then you have a kind of loop, a sort of decision-making process, uh, whereby you update the treatment according to the latest information you have. And so my question is this, is, is this, we're sort of kind of moving in this direction or thinking about this, um, and really, it's a bit of a vague question, but is this a machine learning problem? That is, are there tools within machine learning uh, that could potentially be used to uh, you know, process these kinds of data, to I identify sort of key things? Um, to use sort of data sets of patients, we can maybe sample tens of patients at the moment, uh, maybe more coming along uh, in time. Um, but sort of is this machine learning? I kind of want to chuck this open. I mean, I'm going to be here for the next sort of couple of months. I'm here till the end of February. And so I'm partly hoping to have these sorts of conversations. What can machine learning do uh, for these kinds of problems? Um, and so if, if you've got any insight or just any questions whatsoever, um, I'm just interested in meeting and having a conversation uh, over coffee or something. Um, but for now, just to give some acknowledgements, I've been funded by uh, different people. So uh, these are from my group, Casper and Lay, who've worked on the maths. Um, some people from the clinical side, uh, the reassortment project and the HIV work. Um, and I'm currently visiting Villa, so I'm, I'm, as I said, here for two months, and um, so I'm funded by Helsinki to do that. Um, so really, I'd, I'd love to sort of open up the conversation uh, either now, we've got a few minutes, uh, or again, just for a more in-depth conversation. Uh, if anyone wants to get in touch, I'm very happy to talk about uh, machine learning and these kind of problems. Um, so thank you very much. Um, Time for the immediate questions. Do we have some? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so you started by saying that the, the individual um, uh, positions in the genome, like it's hard to estimate their selection uh, due to the hitchhiking or whatever. That, uh, yes. So right? Yes. You need to so account. Yep. So it's not like it's a um, that, that the effects are independent and there's some interaction. Yes. You could say that. Right. So I, I, I'm not sure if you, if I missed the solution to that. I think that was related to the fact that you had this kind of um, network of different genotypes, where okay. you had like the neighboring ones, and yeah. you could estimate the selection between the neighboring ones. Sure. But doesn't that lead to the problem that you've got an extremely large graph with a high degree? Uh, there's, I mean, you said that yes. there's like ten or twenty places where the mutation can occur, and if you yeah. start estimating all those. Uh, yes, yeah, so there, there is an, at the moment there's an underlying problem of the kind of model space. Um, so ways in which we do that, um, we have ways in which we narrow down which positions we're interested in. Because the whole viral genome is, you know, even though it's short in genetics terms, it's still thousands of bases. Um, so if you just take every possible genotype, well, it's more, there are more genotypes than there are particles in the universe. Um, so, so we have a series of steps to, to really cut down which sites are interesting. Uh, the first one is to look for things where there is some variation. Um, and then secondly, where that variation seems to, um, in simple terms, do something interesting. So there's a change in frequency over time. Um, so so that, that kind of cuts it down to, to a smaller number of positions. Um, uh, and then uh, what th there's then a question of how we identify which ones we think are there. So uh, there's a conservative approach which sort of takes a a reasonable kind of subset of things that we think so we if we don't see something in the data that allows us to cut out a set of sort of possible bits of model space if we just don't see certain combinations we can kind of cut away at model space um so so yes that is a problem that limits the number of positions in the genome upon which we can do this kind of thing um uh, so there are some matrix based approaches starting to come out where you can have a larger space, but essentially the, the model space is, is a constraint. Um, I think if we're, the more data we're able to get, uh, so if we were able to move to longer reads, um, we would then be able to cut out more of model space. So we'd be able to say, actually, we, we observe maybe 100 different genotypes. 
So that, that, I think, will be an advantage of long read data, is that w once it's accurate, you can more easily characterize the space over which you're doing the calculation. Uh, yeah. yeah. So what, how is the evolutionary model now defined? Is it based on full haplotypes or yes. haplotypes? Yes, so, so part of the biology is that the inherent competition is, is one genotype against another genotype. So, so yes, it's based on... Um, so mutation acts across all the genotypes, and then uh, we, we actually use the hierarchical model of selection. So we, uh, we sort of start with a model of no selection and then gradually introduce more and more complex models. So we use a model selection process, so Bayesian information criterion, um, in order to work out a sort of parsimonious solution to the problem. Um, there, there may be other ways, there, there's sort of other ways of doing it, but that's how we're, that's how we're approaching it. So, so it's intrinsically one viral genotype against another. Um, so it gives some indication that the, so we've got two independent models that are consistent with one another, I think that's what we'd say. So, so in so far as we can measure internal consistency, um, we can get somewhere. Um, so that's the question. The, the, the next, the other part of your question concerns conversations with people who've done the experiment. Uh, that's a challenge in the sense that um, uh, so you may want to turn the camera off. 